thank you for giving us this time together. We thank you for your word and look to you, Lord, to teach us and instruct us and then to take your word and apply it to our lives. And Lord, our heart is to know you also in a greater way and be surrendered to your will. So we thank you for this time together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're in Ecclesiastes chapter 9. We're moving through the book of Ecclesiastes. And we're in a section here, uh, like some of the other sections, where Solomon is viewing things as man would view it under the sun, or we could say, without God. And so, as he describes some of these things, there's things that are true for all of us, and things that are certainly true for those that don't know the Lord. But there are some things that are not quite true in the sense of the obscurity of the understanding of the resurrection and life after death and, and heaven and hell. Some of that didn't come into the proper viewpoint, but uh, obviously the rest of the scripture brings it in. So Solomon is, is sharing truth from that perspective, but as believers and those that have uh, the New Testament understand the uh, purpose of Jesus Christ, there is a lot we can bring in based on that. And so we do that as we walk through the book. So again, the, the book is from the Holy Spirit. It is God's Word. It is true. And we want to jump right into verse 11. We left off in 10, and verse 11 says, I returned and saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, neither yet bread to the wise, nor yet riches to men of understanding, nor yet favor to men of skill, but time and chance happeneth to them all. So, the first part of the uh, verse is, is obviously true and, uh, and, and applies to all of us. The fastest runner doesn't always win the race. The strongest doesn't always win the fight. Yet if we allow that knowledge to keep us from running the race or fighting the good fight, then we've allowed Satan to have a victory over our life. And I know life can seem very unfair. I know at times you try to do what is right, you give it all you might, and still you come out on the short end of the stick. And you try sometimes, and you try, and you see that it goes nowhere. Sometimes you do, and, and you give, and it's not appreciated. And there are times that that can be downright discouraging, where you're like, why bother? And you're ready just to throw in the towel. And you're like, it makes no difference I, I can really give it my all and I seem to get hit and battled upon and, and beaten up. Or I just run into a brick wall and I get nowhere. And yet everything inside of you is desirous to do what's right. But because you don't see the effect of that or you see an adversity to that, it can make you very discouraged. And the enemy is doing everything he can to discourage us. But you see, what happens cannot be the determining factor of what I do. What I do needs to be done for the Lord. 
what happens is up to him. In fact, we're even encouraged in the previous verse, in verse 10, that whatever we find to do, we should do it with all our might. That I, I shouldn't be laxed in doing what's right, in doing what is honorable in God's sight. That can even tie into Father's Day as a dad. You do what is right regardless of what you see or if you're appreciated or not or if the results haven't bore out what you thought they should. It doesn't stop me from doing what's right. i got to keep doing what's right in the sight of the Lord. But the enemy takes some of that opposition. He takes some of that that in the, in, the, in the human sense, that failure, which it isn't, but he takes that and you feel like a failure, and you're like, you know, why even try? And yet, the Spirit is saying, you do it with all your might. And in Colossians 3, 23, it tells us this, and whatsoever you do, you do it heartily as unto the Lord and not unto the men. You do it just wholeheartedly unto the Lord. You see, I'm not to focus on man's appreciation, but on God's approval. I, I, I want to do what God approves of, what God would want me to do. I, I can't control the results. I mean, even the Bible tells us, you know, some sow, some water, but it's God that brings the increase. I, I, I can't control the final results of things, but I sure want to be under the control of the Holy Spirit while I'm living out my life. I, I think of the kings, and when you read through the kings, you see in many of those passages and he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. But unfortunately, you see many more passages that say, and he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. And I know the enemy will do everything he can to bring discouragement and stop us from, from doing what's right in the sight of the Lord. But I encourage you, press through that and keep doing what's right. Again, man may not appreciate but if you're doing what's right, God sure approves of it. And that needs to be the, the motivating factor. Serving the Lord and the things of God with all our might and surrendering the results to the Lord. And, and if it's a race, whether I, I win or lose, I want to run the race to win. Not stop halfway and say, you know, it's a rigged race. It's just a rigged race. Why even bother? I, I, I need to continue to run the race to win. To fight the fight. To be victorious. And not let the discouragements of the results or the lack of appreciation sway me or persuade me to do differently. I, I can't do that. I've got to put my trust in the one who is at the end of the finish line. You know, men along the way of this race, they, they may never, never give me the flag as the winner but that's not why I'm running the race I'm running the race to get to the end and there at the end to see my Savior and to hear his voice saying well done my good and faithful servant you have been faithful over a few things I'll make you ruler over many things Enter into the joy of the Lord. You see, that's where my focus needs to be. But sometimes we, we 
we do get discouraged and it's hard and, and we see an obstacle or a discouragement or, or a failure or, or a lack of appreciation and it, it wears on you. It can wear on any of us. But I need to sit with the Lord and say, Lord, and there are times to say, Lord, am I really, should I really be doing this? I, I thought I would see more results by now. I, I thought I would see better things and, and less attack, but Lord, I, I'm not seeing that. Lord, should I keep running this race? This race in New York State? You sure it's not in another state? Should I be running this race within my community, my family? Are you sure it's not somewhere else? Sometimes we like, I think I better run the race overseas somewhere. And the Lord's like, you are exactly where I want you to be. You keep running the race for me. Let me worry about the results. We are called to do that which is right in His sight. And a lot of people we rub shoulders with may not see it as right. It may not be right in their sight, but we don't do it for men. We do it for God. And so what the preacher is saying is true. There, there is truth to that, that it's not always the fastest runner that wins, wins the race. But he believes that it's by chance and, and sees that, well, it doesn't really matter what happens. He, he says, it, it's just, but time and chance happeneth to them all. And in that sense, I mean, things do happen to us all regardless because we're in a fallen world. But I, I believe that my deeds are dictated by God. Not random chance. And therefore, if God knows those deeds that I should walk in, then He and His voice alone is the one I want to hear. And I want to walk in those deeds. In Colossians, well, you can turn there. Turn, hold your place. We'll be back here. But in Colossians, New Testament, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, and you hit Colossians. Chapter 3. I don't know why to allow the, the situations of, of life or circumstances or, or the things that I see to be determining factors in my heart of how I live or how I run the race. In fact, Colossians 3 verse 23 says, And whatsoever you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord and not on to men. You, you, you do it heartily, but and, and let's read the next verse. I think it's very important. It says, And knowing that the Lord, you shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. You serve Jesus Christ. That's who you serve. And so my, my service to God is for God. He already understands the effect of that service, and I can just trust Him with it and stay dedicated to do what's right in His sight. You can turn back to Ecclesiastes. In verse 12 it says, for man also knoweth not his time, as the fishes that are taken in an evil net, and as the birds that are caught in the snare. So are the sons of men snared in an evil time when it falleth suddenly upon him. Now Solomon is viewing this under the sun thinking, this, 
this viewpoint from a, a person that is outside of God. And, and he's kind of thinking, you know, life really doesn't matter much anyway. From, from that point of view, of an under-the-sun point of view, life doesn't really matter much anyway. I mean, how you live and stuff, I mean, come on, when your time is up, it's up. You, you can't determine anything about your life. No more than a fish can determine when a net is lowered to be caught or a turkey is snared for Thanksgiving. It's just a bunch of random chances and times and effect, and, and it doesn't really matter then. You can't, you can't determine or control when evil is determined upon you. And I thought, you know, there might be some true. I may not know the length of my days, but I sure know the one that does know. And he knows the length of my days. I, I thought of this psalm, and I want to read it to you. It's Psalm 139, verse 16, and it says, You saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. You saw me, Lord. You know me. My days were numbered before I was even born. You had a plan for me. You have a purpose for my life. And I'm not going to allow the discouragement of the enemy to stop me from fulfilling all that you created me to fulfill. You have a purpose and a plan. And, and I've been barraged by discouragement and attack and, and, and lack of appreciation. But yet, I'm not going to allow that. I'm going to continue to fight the good fight until you tell me to stop. I, I'm not going to allow other things to determine that for me. I've seen too many Christians allow other things to determine that for them, and I saw God wanting to use them, but they got hit by a wall of discouragement, by an attack from the enemy, by a lack of appreciation, and they just stopped. And yet God never told them to stop. And they just stopped. And yet... God had numbered so much more for their life. And I just want to encourage you, don't stop. Until the one that has that authority and the one that numbered our days says it's time to come home. He that endureth to the end, the Bible says, the same shall be saved. And the enemy is going to do everything he can to discourage you along the way. You probably already know that, don't you? I do. I, do, I know it. The enemy is so quick to discourage. And yet, no, I don't know the number of my days and because I don't know it, and, and any day could be the last, I'm not going to be like the world under the sun and eat, drink, and be merry and do what I want. I'm going to continue to do what's right in the sight of the Lord. And I am grateful that He sends you, and especially His Holy Spirit, to move me along the way in those harder times. And that's what the body of Christ does. We're, we come together and we encourage each other. Keep going. Don't stop. I've shared this dozens of times about the father of the prodigal continued to stay faithful when the prodigal came home. And it's so good when we continue, even though we, we just barely... There are days... 
you probably just barely drag yourself into church. You know, you're, you're kind of like my old cat that would leave something at the doorstep of my house. Wanting to bring it in. In that case, I didn't want it to come in. But I'm grateful that you've crossed the threshold and you're here. Because we need to keep encouraging one another. Let's keep in the fight. Let's keep in the faith. Let's keep going forward and do what's right in the sight of the Lord. It moves on and it says, This wisdom have I seen also under the sun, and it seemeth great unto me. I, I, I love this example that we're going to talk about here. There was a little city and few men within it. And there came a great king against it and besieged it and built a, a bulwarks against it, ready to just overcome even the defenses of the city, to, to basically knock down that wall and enter into the city. They besieged it. Now they're ready to enter in and destroy who's inside it. And a great bulwarks against it. And now there was found in it a poor wise man. And he by his wisdom delivered the city. Yet no man remembered that same poor man. There was a small town with only a few people in it. Your family. Your workplace. Your school. Your neighborhood. And a great king of this world has decided to come against it to lay claim on it. And the enemy is ready to break down the walls and destroy all those that are inside. And yet in this small city, in this family, there was one found who was poor in the Spirit. Jesus said, blessed are the poor in the Spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And this one believer in this small city, in this, in this small community, in this family, has a, a faith in the Lord. And he brings forth wisdom to the situation. To bring the wisdom of God to the saving of men's souls. You know, there are many scholars when they look at Proverbs 8, that in Proverbs 8 they, they see wisdom as God's wisdom, but they see wisdom personified to be the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, the Holy Spirit, through the Apostle Paul, tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 24, that Jesus Christ is both the power of God and the wisdom of God. He makes that clear to us. And you and I, in the small city that God has placed us in, have the ability to bring the wisdom of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, and His Word to those people. God has placed you there. I'm not there. I don't reside in your family, in your neighborhood, your workplace. But God has one, poor in the Spirit, but one, Who's, who's in the kingdom of heaven. 
And he's gifted them with the wisdom of God, Jesus Christ. The wisdom of God, his holy word. And he says, go save that city. At least share the wisdom that I've given you to be shared. And the enemy is there saying, no one listens to you anyway. Why are you going to share any more? Why are you going to keep living the faith? And I want to stand and say, because I know that the God of this world has set his eyes on the destruction of my family, my friends, my co-workers, and the people around me. And I'm going to tell people, I'm going to tell them about the faith that has been birthed in me. They'll, they'll just reject you like the last crowd did. That's not what determines whether I'll share or not. That's not my determining factor. My determining factor is I want to do that which is right in the sight of God. And there might have been people in that city saying, who do you think you are? You're just a poor little beggar. You're, you're nobody in this city. We're going to listen to the great men of the city. We're going to listen to the rulers and the politicians of the city. But God points out it was that man that was poor in the spirit. He had the wisdom of God to save the city. The king's already failed. They allowed the the mighty king to besiege the city. They already had their chance and couldn't do it. Same with the politicians of this world. But God says, my church, they have my wisdom. They have the knowledge of my son. They have the gospel of the salvation needed to save the souls in their little city, in their community. And I pray that God would have us open our lips and mouth and speak that wisdom. Because that's what's needed to save the city. That's what's needed. But they didn't remember him. No, they didn't. But you know, more and more as I get older in the Lord, I'm finding out it doesn't really matter if they remember my name as long as they remember His name. As long as they remember the name of Jesus Christ, it doesn't matter if they remember my name. They, I don't know who that crazy guy was that talked to me. I used to say, I was the guy. It was me. I'm over here. Now it doesn't matter. Because if they remember the Lord, then there's only one name where men need to be saved by, and that's the name of Jesus Christ. So no, you may not be appreciated. You may not be loved upon. You're probably not going to get any great citation of an award. Maybe a ticket to jail, but no great citation from the community. But you come to a place and you're like, I'm not doing it for any of those. Oh, now don't get me wrong. My heart is to see people saved. That's the heart of the Lord. But that won't be the determining factor of what I do. Because if I'm his servant, then what I do is to serve him and keep serving him until he says, okay, Kirk. And I see that with the Apostle Paul. He realized he fought the good fight. He kept the faith. He finished his course. And now he's like, God's saying, I can come home now. I wasn't going to stop prior, but now I'm ready to go to the Lord, ready to be received by God. So you got to let God determine when you're done. Not, not the circumstances of life determine it. Because they may never add up, as Solomon said. Boy, sometimes the fastest 
runner doesn't win the race. And the strongest doesn't win the battle. But that doesn't matter. I'm going to run the race to win regardless of what man says about it. It goes on, and it says, Then said I, wisdom is better than strength. You know, wisdom is so much better. The wisdom of Jesus Christ is better than the strength of men. They will dishonor and despise sometimes what you're saying and the wisdom you're bringing. But don't let that rattle you. In fact, Jesus basically said it this way, is that the only reason as they despise and dishonor you is because they despise and honor me. That's why. So, so don't let that stop you. Wisdom is far greater. You and I hold the most powerful weapon, if you would, against the world or the God of this world. We, we hold the knowledge and the wisdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. We can declare the blood of the Lamb and confess it with the word of our testimony, it, it is the most powerful weapon. And that's why the enemy tries to do everything he can to silence it. It's greater than strength. I, I, a lot of times we look and, and we're, man, I just can't wait until we get a, you know, a more conservative Supreme Court. And then the world says, oh, the Supreme Court is uh, so conservative, it's five to three, you know, or whatever it is, six to three. And I'm like, sure doesn't feel like it. You know, well, we're waiting for this person to come into office, and, and it's not going to be won by the might of man. It's going to be won by the wisdom of God. And the wisdom of God is Jesus Christ and His Son who died for us and shed His blood and rose again and sends the Spirit and forgives man of their sins and redeems them and brings them into everlasting life with Him. It's, it's won by that message. And you have that wisdom. So let it out. Let, let, let it come forth. Well, but they might despise me and say, yes, they will despise you. They despised him. But don't let that stop you. Don't let that discourage you. We keep running the race and fighting the good fight. And I said, wisdom is better than strength. Nevertheless, the poor man's wisdom is despised and words are not heard. That is true. As we stated before, that is true. They're not heard. And the words of the wise men are heard in the quiet more than the cry of of him that ruleth among fools. Well, there is a many that ruleth among fools. There's many even foolish rulers. And, and they're making a, a very, very loud cry. And, and they're declaring the things that they want to declare, both the political leaders and the principalities and powers over them. And sometimes you think that men are listening to them. And maybe the multitudes you see are listening to them. But the words of the wise are heard in the quiet. And when I read that, I thought, Lord, I know what it is. When you send them two by two, 
You sent them out to the individuals, not necessarily to the masses. The masses are hearing a voice that's crying aloud, but it's the voice of foolishness to the fools. But those that are wise in the Spirit, who are born again, have the true strength and message and can come and whisper into the ear one-on-one -on -one of those that you direct them to. And there will be those that despise it, but there will be some that hear it. And if one just heard it, then it was worth all that I went through or all that you had me to do. But I have found that it is the one-on-one -on -one and God has placed you in these little cities as, as Solomon spoke, these, these places with few comparatively. And he says, now, poor in spirit, speak the wisdom I've given you. Don't mind the, the, the noise and the loudness of the fools. You just speak the wisdom. And let me open the ear of those that will be saved. Let me do that. That's my job. And that should never determine me from doing what God called me to do or persuade me either way. You keep sharing the faith, believer, because you have the greatest weapon of all time. You, you've got the greatest power of anything on this earth because greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Greater is he. Wisdom is better than weapons of war. Far better. And the wisdom of the person of Jesus Christ and the message of his world, word is powerful to the world and can bring it down and can bring, and can bring salvation to the lost. And I want to encourage you, the gates of hell cannot prevail against you. So he's placed you in a, a little town, little city. People are there, they're, they're besieged by a great king, the king of this world. Not the king of kings, but that's who they need. And God said, now open your mouth, you poor in spirit, and speak. Because I have a few that haven't bowed their knee to the idols and to the pagan system. And they're just waiting for a preacher to hear the word. Because faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. The last part of that verse, we'll pick that up in chapter 10. It fits right in with chapter 10. So I encourage you, go forward. Stay in the faith. Do what's right in the sight of the Lord. Regardless of what you see or hear or attack, Appreciate it or not. Look to the finish line. Not the finish line of man, whether they approve me or not, but the finish line of God that says, well done, my faithful servant. Enter in to the joy of the Lord. You know, I don't care how tired I am. When I'm there, I think I'll skip over that line. I'll just skip and dance over it. Let's pray. Father, we come before you and we thank you for giving us some time in your word. We thank you for the work of your Holy Spirit. And we pray now, Lord, that you would keep our feet faithful in the race and that you would keep our spirit faithful in the fight. 
And that, Lord, you have numbered our days on what you would have us to do. And within our hearts, we want to do all that you would have us to do. Jesus, what an example when you said, I have done all the Father have asked me to do. May we follow you in that and declare the same by your spirit, by your power, and in your authority. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.